Trade Talk Live. Off. Should we get started? Let's go. Let's let's crack on. It's okay. a beautiful day in London. It's also a, a beautiful day here in San Diego. They buy things to impress people that they don't even like. You do have to change the culture. The culture in the organization is the most important. It's as if reality is splintering into multiple shards. Ladies and gentlemen from around the world, welcome to Straight Talk Live. Very excited to be here with you. I am one of the co-hosts of this amazing show. My name is Rick Snyder. I'm the CEO of Invisible Edge, the author of Decisive Intuition. And we have just celebrated our year anniversary a week ago. And uh, amazing the accomplishments that have happened uh, in terms of having an idea and an inspiration to create a platform to have the conversations that we most need to be having in this world where we feel like we've been tremendously unprepared for with COVID and exposing a lot of the um, just places where we're not in conversation that we need to be on this planet in all the different sectors from the environment to geopolitics to uh, finance to leadership and all the in sustainability and all the key areas that we need to be conversing over. And today is no different as we get into one of the hottest topics uh, in terms of the rise of China. But first, I want to introduce our amazing co-host, Af Maholtra. Af, take it away. Thank you, Rick. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is One Year and One Show. We're one year and one show old. And um, I'm, of course, the co-creator of this show with Rick and uh, also busy with a lot of philanthropic activities in my life and uh, a co-founder of a company called Growth Enabler that's in the AI space. Uh, today is very important for us because we have a, a guest who we have um, spent a good hour with and, and had briefing calls with in the past and one who we admire immensely just because of the way he carries him, himself and uh, the ease at which he describes the history and his um, take on things, uh, especially after his his um, incredible story and his book, The Confessions of an uh, Economic Hitman, that many of us have been just enthralled by. Um, and we're delighted to have um, John, John Perkins back on the show today. So, um, Rick, over to you. There was some disturbance there for a second. Not quite sure what that was. But... Uh, Throwing the back, a ball back to you, and uh, let's get okay. into the conversation. All right. So uh, <laughs> this is one of my favorite people in the world to speak with. I've seen John on stage at um, author conferences and book writing conferences in San Francisco. Uh, he's a dear friend of a dear friend of mine, and he's been a repeat uh, guest on our show. Uh, the first time talking about the difference between a living economy and a death economy and yeah. how we center our, our, all of our decisions based on you know, old fossil fuels and things of death versus what does it mean to be more generative in our relationship to the planet. Today, we're going to have the honor of speaking with uh, John, who's an incredibly established author, uh, um, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and several other New York bestsellers, also an advisor to the IMF in the past and the UN and the World Bank and um, Fortune 500 companies from, and as well as around the world. Incredible pedigree. Um, and has been an, econo an ec economic hitman himself. So he knows exactly about the rise of nations, the rise of regimes, and also when they're falling. So his latest book that he's working on now, and we're honored, I think this might be the first time, John, that you've spoken about this publicly, perhaps. Um, so we're very excited to have you on our show today to talk about the rise of China. John, welcome to Straight Talk Live. Thank you so much, uh, Rick, and congratulations to both of you, all of you, on uh, your anniversary. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm so glad this has been going for well. Thank you. And, Thank and you. A little, I apologize for the little disturbance you heard. I, I thought I was on mute and my cat was, you can hear her, she was screaming <laughs> in the background. I was trying to tell her to be quiet. <laughs> well, thought, just know she's her voice is welcome here too. Okay. I, thought, I thought I was on mute, but it wasn't. Anyway, so yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So let's get cracking here, John. And obviously, you've been deep in research right now and in interviews and all the things that you're studying about China. What had, I mean, all the things you've written about, um, what's had you put your full attention on this as your next passion project? 
Mm. Well, you know, I, I think there's a number of things going on here. I, first of all, um, there's a, what, what I call an economic hitman formula. Mm. And it's been practiced for thousands of years. <laughs> it dates back to the ancient Chinese empire and the Roman and, and Greek empires. It's been used throughout my lifetime. It's, it's, it's still very much in practice. And one of, the, one of the primary factors in that formula, so the formula, the factors include debt and intimidation, uh, resources, the coveting of resources, uh, the countries that have resources but can't, that do not have the financial or technical wherewithal to develop the resources. So countries like, like the United States come along you know, through the World Bank and, and offer loans to develop those resources and use those resources as collateral and and the United States then goes in and makes loans and, and pays and the loans they use to pay our own companies to make huge profits, building big infrastructure projects in the country. We end up taking the resources. That's an old model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I said, the, early, the ancient Chinese used it, the Persians used it, the Egyptians used it, the Romans mm -hmm. used it, and I used it. And the Chinese are using it. But an important aspect of that model is the perception with which the model is promoted. And that's the big thing that's changed with the Chinese. It's highly significant the way that they change that one. And that, that I would say on a, for, on a formula, that would be the multiplier. It is perhaps the most significant part. And throughout history, that perception has been things like, you know, we get to bring civilization to these savages. You know, that's, right. that, that's why we do it. That was the narrative mostly throughout history. Right, or religion, civilization, or religion, or in the, in the case of the United States, it's, it's our form of, of uh, neoliberal capitalism. We've got, to, we've got to convince the world that if, we've got to convince other countries that if they want to progress, if they want to pull themselves out of poverty, they have to ad adopt uh, neoliberal capitalism, our form of capitalism. Mm -hmm. so so, um, John, when we had our chat um, a few weeks ago, you talked about, in fact, the first session we had, you talked about the book you were going to write. And, and I think it's, mm -hmm. it's still about a year away, I think. Um, so you're still in research mode. Uh, Ch China is one of those uh, topics that has been, and countries, that has been studied at, you know, with great detail by many. And what's fascinating about the land is um, the current status of the country and how it has um, geopolitical clout and economic clout in places we would have probably never imagined. And for, for many, it happens, it's happened so quickly. And it's happened in a way that sort of goes against conventional wisdom, Western wisdom, which is typically nations that are akin to the way the West does what it does, the language, the culture, the food, they generally do better. Um, and I, I recall uh, coming from a background in India, that India was seen as, you know, way more, uh, you know, um, sort of comfortable in terms of uh, doing business uh, with the West because it spoke, you know, most people speak English in India. It's got the history from the United Kingdom and so on and so forth. And um, they've bucked the trend, uh, China's bucked the trend. What, what's, what's happened here? How has China got to this place? What's, what's the why behind it? What's the, in your experience, in your research, what's the story here? Yeah, well, uh, that's what's fascinating here is China, <clears throat> beginning in 1978, when Deng took over, Mao died in, in 76, and of course it's been catastrophe under him, 20 million, probably, you know, millions and millions of people died of starvation. The Cultural Revolution was a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Died in 76 and, and down to over in, in 78. And ever since then, and under the current regime of, of President Xi, uh, China did not accept neoliberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. They didn't mm -hmm. ask for our help. In fact, mm -hmm. they rejected it. You know, while well, we're going out and, and promoting the, what's called the Washington Consensus, which is basically uh, the IMF, the World Bank, the U.S. Treasury Department, and, and its affiliates uh, that promote neoliberalism, uh, while we were pushing that on, 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 on Vietnam and Laos and India, 
and everybody else in the world, basically, China was saying, no, that's not going to work for us. We don't want that. We're going to take our own route. And they did. And in the process of doing that, they pulled this incredibly poor country out of, out of poverty to a large mm-hmm. degree. They pulled 800 million people out of poverty. They still don't have a very high standard of living by our measurements, but they've come a long way. And they've become the second most powerful economy in the world. You know, they really created an economic miracle and they did it without our model. They created their mm-hmm. own model. Mm-hmm. They didn't buy into the neoliberal capitalist model, which is a fascinating approach. And, so, and at the same time, then, they've really shown Africa and Latin America and other parts of the world that their model works better. Right. Uh, and, and as a result, beginning in 2019, China became the largest trading partner with Africa and Latin America, they beat out the United States and Europe for the first time in, in, in recent in, in many, in many centuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were beaten out of these countries because their model is more appealing to these countries. And, and we in the United States can think all we want about China. I mean, China has made terrible mistakes. I mean, of course, you know, China has a terrible record on human rights and mm-hmm. freedom of speech and and so many other things. I'm not, I'm not, you know, please don't mis- misinterpret me. What I am saying is that that they did accomplish something without using our model that now has served as a new model for the world. Can you say actually say, say a little bit more about their model? How is it different? What are you seeing as far as their trade, their financial models that are different from the neoliberal version? Well, you, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Rick, when you said that trade, because that's the single biggest thing. So as I said, what the, the, the perception factor in our model is that you need to buy into if you want to be if you want to become prosperous as a country you need to buy into the neoliberal capitalist model and and that model basically says you've got to maximize short-term corporate profits Mm -hmm, regardless of the social and environmental costs Mm -hmm. and you've got to transfer uh, public sector businesses and utilities to the private sector and when we go into other countries, we say, well, actually, you have to sell them off to American investors for the most part. Mm-hmm. Minimize government regulations on businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, cut out controls. Enact austerity programs that reduce spending on health, education, mm-hmm. and other social services for the middle and, and, and the lower income classes. Mm-hmm. Cut taxes to the wealthy. And that's mm-hmm. the assumption that trickle down right. works, that people, when people are at the top of the economic pyramid, short term profits, everyone prospers, which just isn't true. No. Yeah. And then often we also say, well, you got to provide land on which the US is allowed to build military bases, and you've got to vote with Washington uh, at the UN against Cuba and, and other such things. Mm-hmm. So, so those, th- th- that's the neoliberal approach. China, on the other hand, has made it very clear. And, and President Xi himself, he's traveled extensively since 2013 throughout Africa and Latin America. Mm-hmm. He and his, he is his administrator. And, and I've, they've, they've made six very important points, and I've got them written down here. I can give them mm-hmm. to you if you like. That, yeah. are, that are contra- completely, that reject the Washington consensus and neoliberalism. China repeatedly states that they will not interfere in other countries' internal affairs. They will not insist on the privatization mm-hmm. of businesses. Mm-hmm. They will not dictate tax or regulatory policies to other countries. They, they will not impose their will on other countries' foreign policies or political agendas. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will not insist on austerity measures. Mm-hmm. They will not st- seek strategic gains, such as the right to build military facilities on their on other nations' soils. Now, that's that's a huge difference, and. You know, perceptions never uh, don't necessarily get followed through as realities in any of these cases. The United States doesn't always follow through. And may, maybe China won't follow through. We don't know. But what we do know is that these are, these, these are characteristics that they applied in their own country mm. to a very large degree and were, quite succe- and were very, very successful. And now they're telling other countries, when we go in and offer you loans, we, if we still want to do the same thing. The goal is to basically dominate other countries to get their resources to, to build projects to make make big profits and and basically give you control over other countries in one way or another that's mm-hmm. that's kind of that, that that's that's the the equal sign on the on the formula you know if you follow this economic hitman formula you will dominate 
mm -hmm. other countries, and ultimately the world. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think that their goal is, is the same. That's what mm -hmm. it is. But this is, it brings a different perception. And that perception revolves mm -hmm. around trade. It, mm -hmm. They say, you know, they're building this new Silk Road across the world, which they say will help all countries open trade, not just bilateral trade with China. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if Nigeria get, becomes part of the, the, the new Silk Road, it doesn't just open trade with China, it opens trade with all other African countries, and in fact, countries around the world. And that's very different from what the neoliberal model offers. Do you think that's their version of the trickle down? Mm -hmm. Um. No, I think it's I, I think it's I think it's different. The trickle down basically says <clears throat> when people become very, very rich anywhere in any country, it helps the whole country. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's that's the whole idea behind raising GDP, because GDP really reflects uh, the status of the rich. <laughs> most, of the, most of the rest of the people don't really contribute very much to GDP. And I, I you know, it's I think China's torn. Because it certainly has developed its own rich status, but right now we're seeing a reaction against that. We're seeing that with with Ma. We're seeing that you know with with his whole company, and 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 I don't. We don't know where that's going to go. It's it's not clear where that's going to go. But I think maybe China has has recognized that the trickle down doesn't work, and it's hard to sell to the people of other countries. It's easy to sell to the leaders, but it's very difficult to sell to the people. Mm. John, what what uh, it's a fascinating conversation, and it's it's uh, there's so many strands to it. Tell us a little a little bit about um, the whole idea of faith and religion, and that the ideology around um, belief. Uh, how does that play into what what um, the Chinese have laid out there in that six point plan? And because um, there has to be congruence at every level uh, for this to be executed well. Yeah, well. I have to say that one of the problems in writing this book is I'm, I'm as I talk to people like you guys or, or anybody or give people, friends of mine or editors, uh, draft chapters, I find that there's this, this knee-jerk reaction. You know, like if, if I say, and, and again, I want to stress I'm not promoting the Chinese model by any means. Mm -hmm. What I am saying is that a lot of other countries are preferring it to our model. Right. For good right. or for bad, who knows right. where that's going to take them. Yeah. Uh, but, but what I find is that when I say anything good, like, oh, the Chinese pulled 800 million people out of poverty, I, there's a knee-jerk reaction, like, but they're evil. They're bad. <laughs> you know? And, and, and they, they have done a lot of bad things. There's no question about it. You know, look at what's gone on with the Uyghurs. And there's no question about it. And that's come to the forefront. Of course, at the same time in the United States, it's come to the forefront that we have a very strong anti-people of color uh, bias. Mm -hmm. And we've done some pretty awful things to Muslim countries in the Middle East. Uh, but we have to be very, I have to be very careful about how I present these things because what you're saying, Af, I think it really that gets through because we all of us have incredible biases. We grow up with them. I don't, whether you're, if you're Chinese, you're growing up with tremendous biases. If you're American, you're growing up with biases. And within those countries, there, there's many different biases. The Uyghurs have different biases from people who are living in, and living in Shanghai. In the United States, uh, we have different biases, typically speaking, in New Hampshire, where I grew up, from people in Alabama. Uh, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> within each of those, I mean, it's just, it's complex. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we are dealing with some very strong biases right now, very strong racial biases, cultural mm -hmm. biases, religious biases. Mm -hmm. and, but I think at the heart of all of it, there's a huge difference in the way that, that you approach something like a market economy. So we say we have a, a market economy and China says it has a market economy. It says with socialist leanings. We say we have a market economy with capitalist leanings. They have a market economy with socialist leanings. I had this great discussion. I, I taught at an MBA program in Shanghai, and it was fascinating to, to be teaching to these very brilliant Chinese students. And, and one of them said to me, I, I said to one of them, well, it seems to me like your, your idea of market economy is very much like Milton Friedman's in the United States. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, quite the opposite. She said, you know, our market economy is based on our belief in Confucianism. 
We mm-hmm. believe that, that everybody, you follow the leader because you got to do what's best for the community. You got to do what's best for your family. And now your family is the community. Now it's the nation. And we're taking that to the next level, which is the world. She said, we are being groomed to make the world a better place, not for China, but for the world. And this is what she said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think she believed that whether it's what happens or not, we'll see. But uh, and she said, now, on the other hand, your form of market economy is based on, on selfishness, greed for the individual. You mm-hmm. come right out and say it. That, mm-hmm. that, 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 I mean, Milton Friedman promotes that, you know, mm-hmm. maximize short term profits for the shareholder. Mm-hmm. And, and she says, when you when you apply the idea of a market economy or even the idea of general capitalism, it's not, not neo-capitalism, but general capitalism uh, to these two different philosophies of life, you come to a very, very different conclusion. Mm-hmm. And I think that's 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 fascinating. That's what I think mm-hmm. is going on in the world that in a way we have there's a clash mm-hmm. between these these two ideas. Mm-hmm. That are that one that emphasizes individual rights, the, the, the individual, and the other that emphasizes the community. Mm-hmm. And of course, we saw that very strongly with the reaction to COVID 19. In the United mm-hmm. States, it's like, well, I'm not going to wear a mask because I've got my individual rights and I don't care what happens to my neighbors. I, I don't have to think about that. I, mean, I, I don't need to wear a mask. In China, it's like, well, if they tell us to wear a mask because it's going to protect our neighbors, we're going to do it. And, and it's a very, very different mm-hmm. approach to life. Mm. Yeah, it's a fasc- fascinating way of actually looking at it. Um, do you see, um, one more thing I just wanted to ask you really, um, do you see uh, the um, the geopolitical situation, uh, going back to your time as an economic hitman uh, and the hat you wore then, and I know, I know you talked about the Soviet example, um, do you see similar, any similar, similarities between the Soviet Union and, Ch- and China in the way they're doing, they're executing their, their plan? Or do you see this as being um, a completely different realm? Um, what, what, where's the, is there a bridge that, that um, is common that you can cross over? There may be some tiny bridges, but I don't see any big bridge. And I think that's kind of a mistake that we often make in the United States that we, that we, that we do make a similarity. Oh my God, it's the Cold War all over again. Um, but if you, if you look at the, the way that the Chinese approach this, this from expanding trade, the New Silk Road is being expanding trade for all countries. And in fact, they're doing that with the New Silk Road. Yeah. It isn't just going between Nigeria and China or Ecuador and China. It's going between Ecuador and Nigeria, and China is part of that process often, but not necessarily. The Soviets, uh, you know, were very much oriented toward just moving things towards the Soviets. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think another very, very important aspect here is that most of the world didn't want to do what the Soviets had done. They didn't see the Soviet model as a, as a successful model. Uh, the Soviets might offer them aid. Venezuela was Cuba, whatever, willing to take Soviet aid if they could. But they didn't really want a Soviet system. They may have said they want a communist system or a socialist system, but that wasn't the Soviet system. And it just wasn't successful. It hadn't done a good job for its own people. And China's quite different. The world looks at China, or the developing world, whatever we want to call it, the lower income countries, Look at China and say, my God, they did, a, they, they did something amazing. They, mm. they did a miracle. They brought their people out of poverty. They become, the, it, overnight, they become the world's second most powerful country from being in a position where nobody, nobody even mm-hmm. ever heard of them, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the com- questions that comes up for me is how when you have a, let's say, a communist uh, paradigm, and there's not as much room for personal expression and uh, upward mobility and some of these things. And then you're seeing an influx of capitalism that's happening now. And you're seeing the youth and people being more empowered and having more choice and having more financial abilities and, and choices in, the, in that way. Um, what's your sense on what's happening with the newer generations? Um, and are they still completely 
in the mindset of subservience? Is there much more rebellion? Um, how would we even know uh, outside of the Chinese media stream and what's really going on in the pulse of the Chinese next generation? Uh, what's your sense on what might be happening with the next generation and uh, their paradigm? Well, first of all, Rick, I, 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 I want to... I want to address what you said about how would we even know because of the, the kind of repression. Yeah. That, that, you know, the, the United States up until the pandemic was filled with Chinese students. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know, our colleges, I, 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 my, I grew up in a boys' private school, which is now co ed, where my dad taught. And, and so I ended up going to that school. It was a very expensive school, but I went because my dad taught that. I was part of his salary. <laughs> and, I go back and I, up until the pandemic, I went back and taught there every year that 20% of the students were Chinese. Mm. And the school wouldn't take more than 20% because they said the Chinese parents want to send their kids here to learn what it, to learn about America. They don't want to they don't want to send their kids to a school that's got too many Chinese. Uh -huh. yeah. But you know, the, the, the Chinese were very open. They would they would talk mm. about anything. You'd, I'd sit around and have these conversations with them. There wasn't any restriction, there wasn't a, a, a free speech as far as mm. I could see possibly. I mean, were they afraid that some if they said something wrong, somebody was gonna imprison their parents back in China? I don't think so. I don't mm. think so. Maybe I'm wrong, but I didn't see that. Mm. So but what I what I have seen and when I was there teaching at the at their MBA program, what I've seen much more recently with Chinese students in, here in the United States, um, and and now on things uh, when we do sort of internet programs, is that it, it seems to me that like our young people, young people everywhere are very worried, as they well should be, about the future of this planet, mm -hmm. about the future. <laughs> You probably hear my cat Terry the place apart because she wants to get it. She's agreeing with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to, so, and the Chinese students are no exception. They're extremely concerned about the future, mm -hmm. and and they've lived through horrible pollution. Yeah. So yeah. they will right. tell you, they will tell you, you know, we've created a miracle in China. We've had three decades of double digit economic growth, which nobody else has ever had, as far as we know. <laughs> But it's coming at a horrible price environmentally and socially. Mm -hmm. And they say, but we're going to change that. We, we've shown that we can create a miracle. We're going to create an environmental miracle and a social mm -hmm. miracle. Well, that, that's what they say. Again, I keep saying this, but we'll see what, what actually happens. But I, I think like, like our kids, like kids, like young people everywhere, they want to have children. Mm -hmm. And they want their children to grow up in a world that's habitable, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a world that we'll recognize. And so my experience is that, that they, like our kids, are, are very motivated to making the world a, a more sane place, mm -hmm. a better place. They see, they perhaps see a way of doing it that's different from the way we see it, our kids see it. Mm -hmm. Again, it, I think it has a lot to do with this perception that they see it not as necessarily uh, uh, implementing some rigid system of, of, of capitalism or economics, but rather of, instill, of, of, of expanding trade around the world, trade yes. and communications, and opening up mm -hmm. to the benefits of other cultures. We'll, but, you know, we'll watch what happens here. Yeah. Have you spotted any, um, have you spotted any areas on the sides of technology or digital that has um, caught your attention that you believe um, is worth watching, you know, perhaps areas like robotics or um, artificial intelligence, AI, um, nanotechnology, these sorts of areas. Um, I raised the point because, of course, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the technology revolution in China. And there is that always comes up in the in the conversation around Silicon Valley and the tech titans, the, the Western tech titans, and then of course Tencent and Alibaba and and other companies um, are also compared and contrasted, who are equally successful, doing some incredible, incredible stuff. Um, I mean, the deployments of technology with things like WeChat, which is just a complete, uh, all-encompassing um, realm where you go in and you can buy and trade and message all in one. Uh, has been happening for a long time. What have you spotted so far that you believe is again part of the rise? Because the rise has so many s layers to it. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that, if if you have a perspective on that too. Well, this again, uh, this is it's an it's it's an there's a lot of biases that come to play here. 
But I think you, you've hit on the frontier. Uh, the, the, the technology is the, the frontier. A uh, hundred years ago was industrialization and, and today it's, it's technology. And um, I, I think the United States fears that China is going to outpace us. And I, that's a very valid fear if we want to buy into the fear. But the other alternative is to buy into how do we work within that system? So to, 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 to just say, well, we don't want to use their technology because they're going to spy on us. Right? But to me, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, we spy on us. Uh, <laughs> you know? Fair point. Yeah. I mean, right now, if the NSA wants to listen in on this conversation, they're doing it. Uh, I hope that's a good time. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that this, there is this, this Jay, stop it. <laughs> there is this white, uh, I mean, we, we have, you know, the whole idea of the white supremacy or American exceptionalism or however you want to look at it, where we just, we don't want to admit that others can do better than us. And we specifically don't want to admit that others who don't quite look like us. So right. if, the, if the Germans are producing better cars, we're okay with that. But when the Japanese started producing better cars, oh my God, they, they're just copying us. <laughs> They're just copying yeah. us. They're not That's a very important point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a good point. They're just yeah. copying us. And of course, ultimately, we started copying them because they actually were introducing mm -hmm. technologies into their cars that we weren't. Yeah. But we've been saying now that the Chinese have been stealing our, you know, our ideas. They've just been copying us. And maybe there was some truth to that up, to, up for a while, but it isn't any longer. They're, 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 they're leaping ahead of us in many respects. Mm -hmm. And if we're smart, we'll copy them or we'll will join them as we did with as we've done with the China, with the Japanese. Our car manufacturers have have worked out deals. They've they've worked out uh, you know partnerships and and many different alliances and so on and so forth. So everybody can benefit. And and my hope is that what we're seeing now I mean, throughout history, enemies have come together to confront a common enemy. Mm -hmm. right? you, know, you can look at any World War One, World War Two. You can you can look at it, 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 it all yeah. through history. And today, my hope is that we will see that the common enemy is us. It's what we're doing to our planet. Mm. The climate emergency, it's species extinction, it's, it's uh, racial and, 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 and income inequality. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the pandemic and, mm. and it's global. And it, mm -hmm. it all, it's all triggered by the way we, we relate to the resources on our planet, the way we relate mm -hmm. to our planet as humans. That's the enemy. And if we can all see that, as I think the young Chinese have been, are seeing it, I think the young Americans are seeing it, I think the young Brazilians and the young Indians, I think every, the young people around the world are, are seeing this. If we can truly see that as the enemy that will unite all of us to come together to produce better technologies that no longer ravage the earth, that clean up pollution, that recycle, and yeah. that regenerate destroyed environments, then we turn from what we call a death economy to a life economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, great points. Great points. Um, we we have many more questions, but I think a few have come in. Uh, should we tackle a couple of them, uh, Rick? Sure, go for it. Um, so uh, there are quite a few. I'm scrolling through a whole bunch. Um, let me have a look at this. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, yeah. So th there's one question around China's. Uh, you, you've 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 you provided a very different perspective on this, actually, and I'm grateful that you have, because I think we've consistently and cont continuously looked at certain countries, in this case China, as, uh, I'll just use the word enemy, because you used it earlier on. And I'm not sure if we've spent time thinking about how countries can um, come together to fight a con common enemy. In this case, the pandemic is the common enemy. And it's still not convincing that we've really come together. We're, you know, we're not convinced yet. If we really, we're really supporting one another, it's pretty much not in my backyard attitude uh, to, a, to a large degree. Um, but one of the questions that's coming is, given that China has eight of the 10 largest solar companies currently, so this is to do with renewable energy, going back to the climate, uh, do you see the emergence of China as a green OPEC um, or a green cartel, if you want to call it that? Um, what are your thoughts on this? That's a great question. You know, it's a very, very insightful. Uh, uh, President Biden addressed it last night in his 
to talk to Congress. Uh, I think when he said we're going to compete <laughs> with China or everybody else on, on the renewable energies field, mm-hmm. I think China has moved way ahead of us in that mm-hmm. area. But mm-hmm. but if 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 we're to believe that if Biden's going to do what he says he's going to do, and if Congress is going to let him do it, then 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 one of the goals would be to compete with that. And I think in a way, competition is good, just like our car companies competed with Japan, but also we can benefit from each other as our car companies did with the Japanese car companies ultimately. And there's still competition, but there's also, you know, they're, 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 they're springboarding off each other basically to come up with better electric cars, but more efficient cars and so on and so forth. My hope is that is that you know there will not be any cartels in this area. That we will learn that we are learning that uh, just like the drug cartels, cartels don't serve anybody's best interest except the, the, the Godfather, you know, the Don at the top of the organization. None of us needs that, and and my hope is that especially our young people. Uh, we'll see that and are seeing that in, in the Chinese young people and the Indian young people. So, um, you know, it's, but I do think it's significant that China has those eight out of 10 uh, companies. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I haven't seen that exact statistic, but I, I, mm-hmm. I, I trust it. Um, and, you know, we, the United States after 9-11, we get so tr- sidetracked with the Middle East and the war in the Middle East, and investing in technologies that supported (laughs) that, drones and so on and so forth, Mm. uh, we lost sight of the rest of the world. We lost sight of Africa and Latin America and the rest Mm. of Asia. Mm. And China took advantage of that. And at the same time, uh, we we lost sight of of developing a much more energy efficient economy. Mm. There was a lot of lip service, but we weren't really doing an awful lot. Mm-hmm. In that regard, uh, you know, the, the, the programs that, that are being suggested now by uh, Washington uh, uh, try to address that. And, and again, I don't know whether those programs will work or not, but I think we're, 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 at least we're beginning to recognize that if we want to compete in the world, if we don't want to be overwhelmed, uh, then we've, we've got to move in the direction of, t- of high technology. There's, there's no question. That is the future. That's mm-hmm. the steam engine. <laughs> Yeah, that's today's steam engine. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another question that's coming. Um, I think it talks to the points around the, the, the continent of Africa, but what is your prediction um, of China over South Africa as a gateway into Africa? How will the EU or the US react? Hmm. Well, I haven't been in South Africa and, and I haven't studied it specifically, but I think it, it's, I, I, I find the question interesting that it's not how will South Africa react, it's how will the EU or the United States re- react to China's inroads into South Africa. I think we, we really need to look at is how, how, how will South Africa react? How does all of Africa react? And in the last few years, Africa, this number one trading partner has become China. And that's a huge, huge change. And one of the interesting things that's happened in in Africa is that President Xi himself has said, um, we're making big investments in Africa that we don't expect to get any returns from. Uh, And Mm -hmm. basically what he's also saying, he doesn't say it in so many words, but, but what he's saying is we want Africa to be our friends. We want them to support us at the United Nations and other places. Uh, okay. We want to make, we want to become popular in the world. We want our model to become popular. Now, the United States, our banks, uh, which the World Bank, the IMF, those are basic, those are not, not legally speaking, they're not American banks, but in, in, they're pretty much American banks <laughs> and, and EU banks. Um, it, you know, they've, they've, mm-hmm. always, they've always demanded a return mm-hmm. on their investments. They've always mm-hmm. demanded to get their money back or get these conditionalities like, you know, well, okay, you know, you won't get our money back, but, but, but sell your, your public sector uh, businesses, your utilities and so forth to our investors or, you know, let, let the oil companies go in and, mm-hmm. and exploit the collateral resource. Uh, China is not doing that. And so 
for South Africa or any African countries, it, it must be very attractive to look at China as the alternative mm. uh, to mm. us. And the other aspect of it is China has never been involved in a coup to overthrow the government, as far as we know, in Africa and Latin America, or assassinate mm -hmm. one of its leaders. We have extensively, extensively, we've been involved in that. We've admitted, you know, to Allende and, and, and Lumumba and, and, and Ziem, mm -hmm. Mossadegh, Albans, and many, many others. So, and, and we've never, and China doesn't build military bases. Well, they've got one in Djibouti now, but but we have a we have military bases or presences in over a hundred countries. People don't like that, you know. Right. We hated, yeah. it. we hated it when the British were, you know, put stationing their military people here in the 1700s. Yeah, that's a really good point. That you know, we get into everybody's underwear. Yeah. And in China, they don't do that. As you're saying, like, you, you mind your business, you let us mind our business. And as long as we get the trade and the things that we care about, we're all going to be happy. But mm. let's not over interfere in each other's business also. Yeah. And America has never, or in other Western countries, other colonial countries have never really done that, right? And so yeah. that's an interesting distinction there. Um, one of the questions that comes up is around the bank cartel mm. and the central banks of the world, basically. And the question is from Amram, um, how did the bank cartel allow for China to raise its own capital, uh, you know, capital to entrepreneurs? And is the R&D state sponsored in China with less taxes? How does that work? Any sense of that? Well, yeah, and I also want to address, Rick, one other thing you said there, and that, that is that, um, uh, where was I? I'm done at least a couple of thoughts. But I think, um, you know, we what, what was it you were saying about, just before you ask the question. How we interfere and get into everyone's business and China yeah, does not yeah, do yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. So, so what I do want to say is that China has made some big mistakes that are upsetting some of these countries. Like, for example, mm -hmm. bringing tremendous numbers of workers uh, into mm -hmm. Ecuador. Right. is a great, great example. They, 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 they built a hydroelectric dam that's mm -hmm. supposed to serve 30% of the country. They, they, they're building big mines and they bring in thousands of Chinese workers and put them in their own little housing units mm -hmm. and they use their own engineering companies. And then it, this huge hydroelectric dam failed, incidentally. It's, it's uh -huh. not up. It, it, it shorted out the system when they turned it on. It's built on a fault line. It's, it's yeah. not operating. And yet Ecuador is left holding the debt. So uh -huh. I just wanted to point out China's making a lot of mistakes also. Right. And, and countries are seeing this. Mm -hmm. But these are engineering mistakes. These, these are seen kind of as short-term correctional mistakes, mm -hmm. but they're not mistakes in the overall policy. So we'll, we'll see. And mm -hmm. okay, so what was that question again? So the question is, how did the, the bank cartel yeah. allow for China to raise its own capital to entrepreneurs? And is the R&D state sponsored in China with less taxes? How does that work? Well, I, I think that yeah, the, I don't think the I don't think the the, the U.S. bank cartels, the the World Bank, the IMF, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter American Development Bank. I don't think they had much choice. I mean, China was able to raise the capital, and it went out to the world. The United States put a lot of pressure on other countries not to join these banks. It particularly put pressure on countries like the uh, European countries and Australia and New Zealand not to join BRICS, not to join A A I I D. But they did join. And so almost all the country has partic is participating in one or the other of these banks, except for the United States. And there's been a, been a few other countries. Uh, we've seen something similar with Taiwan, where we put tremendous pressure on, on countries not to desert Taiwan and, and, and recognize China, even though we officially only recognize China officially. Uh, but countries just haven't listened to us. So... Mm -hmm. So China has, because it's, it's had such a remarkable excess, success, mm -hmm. uh, countries are, are buying into it. It's like, you know, do you, you want to invest in a, in, in a state company that's had a good history? Or do you want to invest in the one that's really taking off big time? Why mm -hmm. would you invest in Bitcoin? Well, maybe I'd invest in Bitcoin because it's made so much money for so many people. and It's, mm -hmm. it's proven successful. Maybe it won't in the future, but right now it's pretty good. So I think the world kind of looks at these Chinese banks as being a, a great opportunity. And they go along with the New Silk Road. So, you know, we're going to use these banks to help you in South Africa 
or Chad or Botswana or where we're going we're gonna to use this new Silk Road to help you expand your trade to other countries in your region throughout Africa, as well as with us here in China. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. very, very attractive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost an open source model, right, to some extent. Um, there's another question on when you, when you talked about Bitcoin. And that wasn't deliberate because it came in just before. <laughs> the question is China's digital currency um, is essentially banking the unbanked. So they've just launched a digital currency, of course, and at government level, we haven't quite done that yet in, in the many countries in the West. Um, any thoughts on that, uh, John? Well, this, I, in my opinion, the, the, the dollar is going out. Um, mm. uh, this could change, but uh, countries resent sanctions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as long as the dollar is the controlling currency, we can impose sanctions on other countries. If the dollar were not the controlling currency, the sanctions wouldn't mean much. And so Russia, the UK, China, the United States, we're all looking at, at, at the, you know, cryptocurrency. Uh, it's the, I think it is the future. I don't, I don't know that's necessarily Bitcoin, but I think cryptocurrency, I don't know that it's a Chinese form. I don't know, see, I don't know where that will go. Maybe there'll be a number of these, but, mm -hmm. but I do believe that, I don't think this can be any question, that that, that is the future. It, it simplifies everything. It, it kind of levels the playing field in many respects. And it takes the power out of the dollar. It takes the power out of the U.S. tariff policies and sanction policies and, and, and so many of these areas. You know, Russia, one of the ways Russia has been able to get around some of the sanctions is by mm -hmm. using cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. it's oil and, and gas. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you think about the Silk Road example, the China, um, the, the friends of China, the network, it continues to grow. And um, mm. if they're not going to use fiat currency, Juan, they're going to use the digital currency. And so there's your distribution channel already, uh, even amongst those countries and nations where there's uh, active trade um, and there's active transaction because the crypto only works if you can spend it somewhere. Of course, otherwise it's sort of flaky. So you have, you have a great point. Um, Rick, what were you saying? Yeah. Um, there's an interesting question here, too, about soft powers. So, you know, hard, like what are China's most prevalent soft powers that they're using today? For example, hard powers might be more military, strength of force, financial leverage, those kind of things. But soft power, uh, according to Joseph Nye's concept, is more in terms of like culture or values or policies in these ways. Mm -hmm. What are you learning about uh, how China is being effective in their narrative that's spreading globally? Um, and what are some of their soft powers they're using right these days? Well, I, I, I think, as I pointed out earlier, the, the biggest one is that they promote trade. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is all about trade. This mm -hmm. is not about domination. This is not about sort of a, the United States is, I mean, you almost could call it a mercantile system that looks kind of like what the British Empire looked like at one time, where everything kind of has to filter through us one way or another. It's not quite that simple, but it's sort of that simple. <laughs> and, and the Chinese are saying, no, that's, that's not our model. Our model is we want to encourage trade between all countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what they're saying. Uh, I think another one of the soft uh, power issues is, is, is the, the Confucian concept, the concept that yeah. uh, we, we need to work for the community. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, the, 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 you know, the other books I read about, and the, 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 so I got these two spectrums, one is economics and the other is indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. And if you look at traditional indigenous cultures and ones that still exist in parts of the Amazon and such places, their orientation is toward the community. It's not right. toward the individual. And I think if you, if you look at human history for 250,000 years or so, uh, we lived pretty much in cultures that we, we, everybody had to take care of everybody else. You know, if somebody was suffering, then everybody's suffering. And, and that's changed in the last few thousand years, maybe, but especially in the last uh, hundred years, the last few decades, even more, we, we've grown more that way. This idea of, of community spirit and of looking at the long term, that's the other one, whereas our orientation is towards short-term profits. What's, uh, we, we used to say it was the quarterly income statement, but now it's it's the daily stock market report. Yes. Uh, you can't yeah. turn on the radio at that, you know, four or five o'clock at night at Eastern time and, and not hear something about the stock market. Yeah. <laughs> well, most, a lot of radio. Uh, 
that's very short term. The Chinese have the 30 year plans. They, they, they really look a lot more at the long term. And I, I think that's, that's very appealing to people around the world. They're saying the short term process is just plain not working. Trickle down isn't working. Stop make, giving all these benefits to rich people. It's just not working. You've got to, it's bottom up economics. It's something that Biden talked about last night. You know, we got bottom up. Um, so, but these are all, I think, very strong points that the Chinese can make. And the very example, the, the model that they've created of, of bringing so many people out of the dark ages of the Cultural Revolution, bringing them out of dire, terrible poverty and starvation to something much more reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. They've they got a long way to go, but something more reasonable. And in terms of your book and your writing right now, what are you hoping to contribute to the conversation around the rise of China? What are you hoping people get from what you're seeing in, and um, constellating together? Um, what's really the through line that you're hoping your reader uh, is impacted by? Yeah, I think there's several things. One is it, I think it's important to recognize that one of the reasons that China is making such inroads is because of the mistakes that I made and other people with my job, economic hitmen. You know, we went about using this formula to, to benefit our own corporations and to exploit resources for our own country's use. And that worked, but it also caused tremendous resentment and that opened the door to China. I think it's important for people to see that because only by recognizing the mistakes we've made can we correct them. Mm -hmm. it's not to say we're horrible people or, you know, it's to say when you make a mistake, admit it and then go about fixing it. Mm -hmm. And so, so part of my goal is to say, we can fix this thing. The other thing is to show the mistakes China's making, as well as the successes, the engineering problems that I mentioned, and to show that, you know, we, we, can, we can show the world that we can do things better. And then ultimately, I, my goal is to say, let's come together. Let's recognize that we're all facing a, a crisis on this planet. Mm -hmm. We human beings are the pilots of a space station, the Earth, and we've been navigating her toward disaster. Uh, let's reboot the system. Let's renavigate her. And the space station is a great example because we've got a space station up there now that's that's had Chinese in it and Russians and Americans and a few other nationalities. Right. We have come together in that realm. We can come together. And so to see that as a as a as a as a mini model for for the maxim maxim model of the of the planet, I think is 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 reasonable and inspiring to say, well, let's mm -hmm. let's all come together mm -hmm. to make this space station of ours livable for future generations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really like your point here <clears throat> of a more holistic approach. Obviously, uh, that speaks to me. And so often, when you hear people talk about China, it's very binary. And it's very, you know, they're the new threat, the bad guys. And then we don't look at our blowback of, well, how do we get here? What caused the situation as it is now? And what can we do about it? How can we re-enter this relationship in a different way than try to recreate a Cold War of the Soviet past? How can we do this in a different way now, especially given that we're so much more aware and conscious that we share the same resources on the planet? We, sh we know we have a relationship we have to tend to if we're going to get if we're going to continue to thrive let alone survive together so it has to be a different relationship what would you say to people who might be listening right now and getting that message but might also be thinking yeah john that sounds great and you might be really naive right now because china doesn't give a shit about that and they're just going to dominate the next round how, how would you respond to that well i say that's an interesting concept and maybe you're right and maybe you're not uh uh but let's let's not let's so you know my, my, last, my most recent book was called touching the jaguar which means that when we have something that we fear we can't run from it we have to go touch it we have to confront it so mm. the people that, that are looking at things that way they're, they're looking at this as fearful mm -hmm. you know china's go over going to overwhelm us it's like the, the red tide of communism that we were told that if Ho Chi Minh won in Vietnam, there would be the domino effect and the, and the Soviets and the, and, the, and, the, and the Viet Cong and everybody else, would, the, the red tide of communism would take over the world. It, it never happened. It didn't even come close to happening. It wasn't even a goal of, of those regimes at all, mm -hmm. as we've seen. 
where I so I think to, to, I'd say to the people that, that look at this this way, that's fear. And when you have a fear like that, touch it. Let's go out and, and, and touch the Chinese. <laughs> Listen to their students. You know, if you believe that they're trying to do this, then then help them not to do it. Convince them that our and convince the world that our system is better. Look, we're not going to change the Chinese at this point. I don't think by by trying to force them to change or by calling them wrong or evil or anything else. We but we may change or modify them and the world by showing a good example. Let's do that. We've shown a bad example. I was part of that. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that you know, it, it was a good example for us. It helped the United States become a, the wealthiest country in the world. But at the same time, it it disturbed people in other countries. Mm -hmm. It didn't satisfy their needs. Mm -hmm. And let's turn that around and do it. Let's show China, let's show the world mm -hmm. that we have a model that will make this planet livable for future generations. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on that rather than our, and, and touch our fear of the Chinese and say, okay, so what do we do about that? Where do we go with that? We don't just say, oh, they're evil. Ignore them. Hide from them. You can't hide from them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're out there. They're doing what they're doing. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think the, other, the other aspect is the invisible nature of trade. As a consumer, most of the products that we use today have some Chinese components in them, if not all. And so for a long while, we have already um, unknowingly accepted that um, it's globalism and globalization is there and we're, we're part of it and we're powering it. We're funding it, really, with our salaries and, and our incomes. And, and suddenly, with what's going on in the world, I think, I think the pandemic is, there was a question that came in earlier. I'm reluctant to sort of ask that question from the person who sent it over because um, it goes down a it goes down a dark path, and that's not the purpose of today. But I think the pandemic is the the noise that's created on the back of coronavirus and and the pandemic and blame games and so on and so forth. Who knows where it came about and how it came about? And there are loads of conspiracy theories. But I, I think one of the most important takeaways from today, and I think it's important we change our entire mind mind frame now, is that we need to start to focus very much on the issue at hand. And the issue that is the most important urgent issue, which is the planet. And frankly, we've been distracted. We've been distracted for a long time, haven't we? Um, on abundance and materialism and, and consumption and our way and the rest is wrong and, and blame some, the blame game. I think it, you, you take a very good perspective on it. And hopefully if your book, and I assume it is, is taking that sort of a view, uh, then that is a more acceptable, more um, grounded view. Uh, there's more consciousness in that view than the, what we've been, what the media is throwing at us. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, at this point, what we're consuming, why Straight Talk Live has been relatively popular is because we have these diverse viewpoints that are relatively objective and independent and talking about doing good, not detaching ourselves from reality to say, well, everything is hunky-dory. But your perspective on this, John, given that you have come from a world where you have...